Take your Bibles, if you would. Let's see here. Let me make sure I got the right deal going here. Um, I did order a new, finally ordered a new wireless thing here for my laptop to be able to be seen on the screen, but I don't have it this morning, and I still couldn't get the old one to work. So I've got this big bulky cable up here. And uh, so anyway, I don't know what in the... I'm not sure why that verse is up there. Let me go to this one. There we go. Uh, the inspiration for this message came, make sure my microphone's on, came as a, uh, Lisa and I were, when we were in Indiana, um, we went to a Mexican restaurant. And uh, we were sitting there, we had ordered, and... Uh, we saw this fellow going around from table to table and he had looked like jewelry and things like that that he was I guess selling to the customers that were there and uh, so Lisa's like oh you're gonna buy me something I said well yeah let, let's see what he see what he's got when he comes by here and uh, he comes by and he says uh, senor would you like to buy and he showed us what it was. And it was a whole big old long thing full of rosary beads. And of course, my wife was a little disappointed. I was disappointed. And uh, I thought, eh, I'm not buying no rosary beads. And that got me to thinking. And I, and I don't know if I said this to Lisa or not, but. Uh, I may have said something like, you don't want me to wrap those around your hands when in, in your casket. And it got me to thinking about people that do that. I, I've, I've preached uh, 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 funerals where uh, even though the people weren't Catholic, somebody, somebody in the family was Catholic. And they saw fit to make sure that so-and-so's hands had a rosary clasped in his hands. And I got to thinking about what that means and, and why, why they do that. And uh, I, then, it, then I, I started going through different religions and different religious practices that I know of. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a student of religion. I think it benefits... Uh, us to know what other people believe uh, and to know then I think it definitely benefits you to know what you believe because somebody at some point is going to ask you or they're going to put you to the task of, of saying well, how come you don't believe this or how come you're not this how come you're not Catholic or uh, you know, why don't you come to the Mormon church or why don't you come to the Jehovah's Witness church or why don't you come to uh, this such and such a church? Why don't you do this? And uh, you need to know then what you believe and why you believe it and be ready, the Bible says, to give every man an answer that asks you of the joy that you have, the gospel that you believe in, you ought to be able to at least with three or four verses from the Bible, surely three or four verses from the Bible, you could tell somebody just the basics of what you believe and why you believe them. And maybe I should just task you this morning and uh, be glad I don't feel mean this morning or I might make you stand up and say, tell me four verses why you believe you're going to heaven. Quote them from memory. I did that out in Kenya and uh, when we were in Samburu and, and this gracious church that always has me preach out there every time I go. And we had a, it wasn't part of the morning, Sunday morning church service. It was more of a teaching session in the afternoon. There was a lot of people there. And, uh, but I noticed that uh, all of the people there, they knew all the verses to all the songs that they sang. Boy, they, I mean, they were good singers. And they sang lots of music. Boy, they do. And put on a real nice, 
Real nice little show with their music. And I asked them, I said, who in here, I see that you know all the verses to all those songs, who in here can quote me five verses from memory? And there wasn't a person in the whole place that could stand up and do that. One lady said she knew one verse, and I said, what is She said, uh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And I paused for a minute, and I, and I, I don't remember if I said, where's the rest of it? But I said, well, you left part of it out. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I wasn't trying to embarrass anybody, but it just bothered me that the people, as good as they were, could not quote three, four, five verses from their Bible, from, from memory. They couldn't do it. Most of these kids here are taught uh, in their school. They're taught in Sunday school to memorize verses from the Bible. And they can my son Caleb, who's lost right now, can quote you, I know at least four or five verses from the Bible. And so I would ask you this morning, just as a, um, I guess, an introduction to the message, could you defend the faith that you say you have without a Bible in your hand could you defend the faith that you say you have? I just want to encourage you with that. I'm not going to shame you. I'm not trying to beat you over the head. I'm not trying to say I'm better than you are, because I know I'm not. But be ready, the Bible says, to give an answer to someone that asketh. Is that, is that okay enough? Can I say that? Say amen? Amen. So anyway... When this guy came by with those rosaries, I got to thinking about how many people in this world, and I, I had the title already written out in my head, and I got my phone out, and I wrote notes in my phone so I wouldn't forget it, and I was using the notes yesterday as I was putting all this together, of how many people who think, now Lindsay, this will be the name of the message I think this morning, People who think they're going to fool God. People who think they're going to fool God. Let's read Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It's up there on the screen, but I'd like you to have your Bible open. Take a look at it. See it in your Bible. Maybe underline it in your Bible. Do what uh, dear Mrs. Waymire did. Uh, bless her heart. Uh, she used to underline in her Bible and write the date down of whenever I preached on a certain passage of Scripture. She used to write that date down in her Bible. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... Now listen to this now. And I've been preaching on righteousness. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in His sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, you know the Ten Commandments, or you should know the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Everybody knows thou shalt not steal. Well, that what it does is that it gives you the knowledge of what's wrong. It's like, um, it's like driving on the road out here, and you're, doing, you're going merrily along at 80 miles an hour, and then you find a speed limit sign that says 65. Well, now you've just figured out that you're doing 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. They will pull you over for that. Or they'll rescue you out of your wrecked car for driving so fast. But the law does not save anybody or keeping portions of the law or doing good deeds or showing, um, what can I call it? Putting on airs of religion. Making it look like you are close to God and that you believe in God and that you follow God and you do what God says. And that's, 
What really, what it, what it all, and I'll explain it in a moment, when it all comes down to it, the idea of, of, of them putting a rosary over someone's clasped hands in their casket is the belief that when God sees the rosary, and especially, now get this, this is a real thing. If you are fortunate enough to have that rosary blessed by the Pope, then you get a free ticket to do all the sins you want and you can still go to heaven because you have on you a rosary blessed by the Pope. Now, I did not make that up. So now think about that and where I'm going with it. These are people now who try to fool God, who think that they are going to fool God when they die in their judgment day. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by what? So how do we get to heaven? Is it by keeping the law, by doing good deeds, by, by, by uh, having the Pope bless you? Or I believe Jesus Christ. I trust Jesus Christ. I trust his word. I don't doubt one thing in my Bible. I believe it all. And I believe it's all for me. And I believe that God will save me. On that day when I will need that, that last bit of salvation in my life to get me from this world into heaven, I believe that it will only come by Jesus Christ. Imagine that poor soul in hell who watches a, a loved one take a rosary and wrap it around his body's folded hands in the casket and him screaming in agony, it doesn't work! Imagine that. Because it doesn't. They thought, or somebody thought, they could fool God. Uh, verse 23. For, oh, let me go back and finish verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what church you go to, what church you don't go to. Doesn't matter. Do you believe the word of God through Jesus Christ? Then he says, "For now, this, now we know where this verse is in the context of. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's one of the verses that we use. If somebody needs to be saved, we go through what's called the Romans road. Romans 3.23 is the first one out of the chute. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How much does it cost to get saved? Zero. That offering we took around was not payment God's payment plan for you to get saved by. It was just, if you want to give, you give. If you don't, you don't. And by the way, sometimes people don't give. Maybe they don't have it that week, or maybe they just didn't think about it, or, or, or whatever. God doesn't even hold that in account. If it's a sin, it's a sin, doesn't matter what it is. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he gives you grace for free, then it doesn't matter who it is or what it is or what you did. Amen. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, just ask your blessings now upon this message. And uh, Lord, open our eyes and our ears, Father. And maybe someone who's listening to this, God, who thinks they can fool you. 
by their deeds of righteousness, by the things that they do or the things that they don't do. They believe that you'll bless them because they did this or they didn't do this. They believe that you'll bless them or you'll bless them more than you'll bless others because they live better than other people. God, that's not how it is. You put no difference from one man to the other. You saved all men who come to you. You save all of them to the uttermost. And it doesn't matter who they are or where they came from. And Father, I thank you for that kind of salvation. That's the kind of salvation I need. Lord, I'm very undone. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless my faith and my trust in you. Because I put no confidence in myself. Father, bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Now, get to this. Ezekiel 33, turn your Bible there. This is, a, this is a, a verse to those, and I've, I've used this before. Uh, I had a conversation with a young man one time who believed that with every sin that he committed, he lost his salvation. And uh, I, I met with him one time at, at my house, and I went back in our room, and I, I just sat and talked with him probably two hours. And I reasoned in scripture with him and I could not get him out of that concept. That if you sin, you lose your salvation. That's what he believed. You sin one time, you lose your salvation. And you can pray and get it back. But if you sin again, you lose your salvation again. Plus all the sins that God forgave before, he has now unforgiven them. And I did. I, I mean, he was, he was in it bad. And I tried everything in Scripture, and I read this to him. And he looked at it a completely different way than I did. But Ezekiel 33, 12, God says to Ezekiel, Therefore thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. What does that mean? That means, let's say that, let's say that boy, you were having a good day. You woke up smiles. You blessed everybody in your house. You kissed your children. You loved on your husband or your wife. Uh, you even put little special things in their lunch box for them. And then uh, when, when they all left and you, they went to work or they went to school and then you went to work or you went to do whatever it is you do during the day, you were all smiles and you prayed for people throughout the day. And you read your Bible. And, 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 and you listen to Christian radio. And boy, I mean, you're on top of it. You are just on top of it. And just, I mean, doing well. And the, even the boss came that day and chewed you out. And you just took it with a smile and said, Sorry, sir, I'll do better next time. I promise you, I want to do right for this company. And I mean, you just, you just got God all over you. And then on the way home, Somebody pulled out in front of you, almost hit you, honked their horn at you, flipped you off. And you cursed inside your head. That's a sin. That's a no-no. Guess what happened to all that good stuff you did all day long? God took the cloth and went... It's gone. Those people who weigh sins and good deeds and bad deeds. Oh, I got my good deeds. Oh, they're piling up. I did a couple of bad things now, but they still aren't as bad as all this good stuff that I did. Well, God's telling you right here. He is speaking to you and he tells you right in, in no uncertain terms. In the day that you commit a transgression, it won't save you. It won't help you. You lost it all. It's a zero-sum game with God. It's all or nothing. That's how God measures us. He measures us with perfect measurement. And if we can't live by God's law perfectly, then there is no salvation by His law. So He says, 
As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. It's plain as day. Now God says nothing in his word about this. I'm going to sh share this with you. This, this idea of this guy coming by with rosaries. Did you know that people who aren't even Catholic probably will buy one of those? And they'll maybe carry that around. Or they'll maybe use it as a book marker. Or they might hang it from their uh, uh, rear view mirror in their car. And, and, and act as far as that rosary goes. Act religious. And believe now that because they have that, that God will look upon that and he will wash all their sins away because they bought a rosary at a Mexican restaurant. How many of you remember a day going back years when the hippies came out and it seemed like every hippie there was, they wore a big old cross. How I many of y'all remember that? What in the world were they doing? Acting religious. Thinking that this little religious piece that I'm wearing will show God that I believe in Him. But their deeds and the fruit of their life is showing that they are sinners and that they are far from God and they do not believe in His grace. They do not believe in His mercy. They do not believe. They wear a cross, but they don't believe in the cross. So let me tell you a little bit about papal indulgences. This actually still goes on. Let me read a little bit to you from a... a this is a Catholic website. The indulgence system was formalized by Pope Urban II... 1035 to 1099 during the Council of uh, Claremont in, in 1095. If an individual performed enough good deeds to earn full or plenary indulgence from the Pope or lesser ranks of churchmen, all their sins and punishment would be erased. That is something that the Catholic Church does not want outsiders to know, but they still believe in this. Which is why they put on, and I'm listen, I'm not making this up. Look this up. Wikipedia's got an article on it, I think. But if every Wednesday, the Pope, if he's in the Vatican, every Wednesday, the Pope has a papal audience in this big auditorium that looks like a snake's head. I'm not making that up. Amen. And, he ha and he's in that audience. And he gives a little, little sermonette. And he might answer a question or two. And then he goes down the crowd. And he does this. As he's going down the crowd. And what he's doing is that he is blessing them... And he's blessing their religious icons, whether it's a St. Christopher medal or whether it's a, a crucifix or whether it's a rosary with a crucifix or whatever. But if they've got it and the Pope in their presence does this, they believe then that when they're wearing this and if they wear it when they die, they will receive an automatic, complete Forgiveness of every sin they committed. They think they're going to fool God when they die. Titus chapter 3 verse 3. Turn there. 
For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Verse 5, look at this with me. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through the Pope. Does it say that there? No. It says through who? Jesus Christ our Savior. Only Jesus Christ can confer that blessing on you of having all of your sins forgiven and it's conferred upon you and only upon those who believe. Let me give you that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever weareth the cross, whosoever weareth the crucifix, whosoever prayeth the rosary, whosoever hath the rosary around their hands, no, whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. And the devil, and I, listen, I'm going to be done with the Catholic Church here in a minute. So, so the indulgence came to be associated with people buying them, whether by offering to donate sums to charitable works or by constructing buildings to praise the church and all the other ways money could be used. You know, like in lawsuits to pay off uh, what pedophile priests have done. That practice began in the 13th century and was so successful that soon both government and church could take a percentage of the funds for their own uses. Complaints about selling forgiveness spread. A wealthy person could even buy indulgences for their ancestors, relatives, and friends who were already dead. Does that sound like the gospel to you? Your, your, uncle, uh, your uncle Ernie who was nothing but an alcoholic, a drunk, a pervert, a scumbag, did wrong, did everybody in your family wrong. Burning in hell right now, but the belief is that somebody rich in the family can buy him out of hell so that he can go to heaven. If you could buy somebody out of hell, why did Christ die? So there it is. And I, I want you to think about this now. Next funeral you go to, and you see somebody you know in that case. Listen, if it was somebody, if it was somebody in my family, like when my dad died, if, if I would have seen somebody try to wrap his hands with one of them stupid crews, I think I'd have pulled it off and cut it up. In front of everybody. That is nothing but a belief in works salvation. And by the works of the flesh can no one be saved. Amen? So these people here. I mean I got this message. Just as soon as that guy was stood there with them rosaries. I got this message. Boom, boom, boom. I started thinking about all these things. Let me get to the next one. Turn to Judges chapter 12. Now we're going to get to some others. Judges chapter 12. You see, it, it is going to be known who is righteous and who isn't. It is going to be known who is saved and who is not. It is going to be known who is on the Lord's side and who isn't on the Lord's side? Do you believe that? I don't want there to be any question when I die of 
whose side I'm on. Am I right with God? I don't want, the, I don't want anybody to say, well, you know, he did do this or he was like this. I don't want anybody saying that because I did something, I'm not in heaven. Or because I didn't do something, I'm not in heaven. I've got a list for you of things I haven't done and have done. That immediately disqualify me from going to heaven. But I'm going to heaven by God's grace. By God's mercy. So here we have an example in Judges. Chapter 12. Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. Now they're having a little family quarrel here. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan. That means they got the roadways. And they put up roadblocks. And they're not going to let certain people in. In case you think that it is some Christian virtue that we allow people into our country illegally, it's not. Thank you, young men, for shaking your head. You've raised you a good boy right there. I mean, as soon as I said that, he's going. By the way, he's the one that said, I'm broke. I recognize somebody that's a lot like me pretty quick. And they, they just weren't going to let them in. And so, verse 5, the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so. That when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, let me go over. That the men of Gilead said unto him, art thou an Ephraimite? And if he said, nay, then said they unto him, say now, Shibboleth. Say the word, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. You know, people who speak the same language, sometimes they can't say the same words. And it was known immediately you're trying to pretend you're not an Ephraimite. Well, then say the word. Shibboleth. Shibboleth. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. That may seem harsh. But Listen. In the book of Revelation, God gives a description of why there's walls and gates around Jerusalem. It is that certain people cannot go in. Dogs, whoremongers, liars, murderers. They cannot go in. Amen? Anybody, let, let me just say it like this, anybody with sin in their life, which is everybody, cannot go into heaven. Now what God does through your faith is that he saves you and he has mercy on you so that you can say, Shibboleth, I can go in. I may, listen, I, listen, I know I used to be an Ephraimite. But bless God, God saved me. I'm a Gileadite now. Amen. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and He's going to let me in. But there's some people like these Ephraimites here who think they're, who think they're going to fool God. Now, this is a Masonic uh, lambskin apron. The purpose of this apron, this, this is from their website. The white of the Masonic apron is universally understood as the color of innocence. And lambs are also recognized as symbols of innocence. 
The Masonic apron should always be clean as the symbol of innocence should reflect the Freemasons' character and their ability to uphold the purity of life alongside a clear conscience and a moral record that is unblemished. You know what it teaches? That if you wear that before God, that God will see that apron and say, hmm, you must be a good guy. Therefore, you get to come in to heaven. Is that how it works? No. Although the symbols adorned on the apron will change over time and color will be added to show progress, the symbolic white of the apron will remain as a reminder of the purity of the Masons. They are taught, and if you've ever, if you've ever been to a, a funeral of somebody who was a Mason, they are taught that by wearing that in their coffin, that God will see them and say they are righteous. That's a lie. There is none righteous. No, not one. And you know what Adam and Eve put on themselves when they tried to cover up their own sin? What does the Bible say? Apron. They tried to cover their own sins. And you know what? There are people, and it doesn't matter what religion you're in or what religion you don't have, there are people who try to cover up their own sins. And they think that that will get them in. Listen, they think that they're going to fool God. But you can't. God always knows the difference. Lisa and I, when we go out preaching somewhere, that's the first thing we do is we look for, there, there's be these yellow caution signs on the side of these old country roads with a with a, a Amish buggy on it and we're going yes where are they because we like to go to their shops we just like jelly for some reason and honey okay and homemade soap and all that stuff I've been around Amish Mennonite people enough I have a pastor friend pastor Reg Kelly who pastors down in southern Missouri he works around a lot of those people uh, Pastor Kelly uh, runs a uh, sale barn down there. He auctions cattle. And he said, Mike, I work around these people. And he said, they're fine people as far as folks are concerned. They're hard workers. But he said, their belief in their salvation is based upon the clothing that they wear and the rules they keep. And I want you to notice that... Let me do this. Here, you have women wearing this kind of head covering and wearing black. But here, this kind of head covering and it's a different color. And over here, I want you to notice that the men wear vests. But down here, the men wear suspenders. Did you know that it varies from Amish group to Amish group. And one Amish group would look at another Amish group and say, they're all going to hell because they're not wearing suspenders. It gets to even to the point to where some of the Amish men will wear their suspenders in the back straight up. And some of them will wear them crossed. And if you are in a Amish clan, where the suspenders are crossed and you show up one day with your suspenders not crossed, you could have a shunning on you. If you break the rules of the Amish or Mennonite group, according to them, they, they will put you out and you will not go to heaven. That bishop... The, and those elders rule over those people. It's just like the Catholic Church. They, they must wear this dress. They must do this work. They can't have a telephone in their house 
but they can build a little hut 10 yards from their back door, put a telephone in it, and go out there and talk on the phone all day long. But they can't have it in the house. One guy, there's a documentary on YouTube, a guy, oh boy, he's in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He started having Bible studies. They put him out. And he said, you know what? I love who I am. I love the work. Don't get me wrong. He said, I love the way we live. And he said, but I started reading the Bible. It was a King James. He said, I started reading the Bible. And he said, I didn't see nothing in here about suspenders, bonnets, the color of the dresses, or putting a bowl on a head for head haircuts. He said, I saw in here that a man is saved by grace through faith, amen, and not by works, lest any man should boast. And I'll tell you what, they boast. They boast. Uh, so do these guys. They boast in their self-righteousness. They boast in their self-righteousness. Mormons. They boast that they keep good morals and good works. Uh, it is a young man's dream, it is every young man's dream, to grow up and to be qualified to be a Mormon missionary. And you can go and be a Mormon missionary and you can knock on doors and ride your bicycle around and wear your white shirt and your tie and you can hand out gospel tracts and try to bring people into the Mormon church and they believe that those works will help you get into heaven. They also believe in temple endowments. That, and I've got a pair of Mormon underwear up here. It's not a joke. When you are married in the Mormon church, you will wear these underwear. And you'll wear them the rest of your life, you and your wife. Because when it, let me tell you what happened. When uh, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith were in Nauvoo, Illinois... They all got, all the men got inducted into the Masonic Lodge. And they learned the, the phrases and the rituals of Freemasonry and induced that into Mormonism. And so they believe that once you are married, you are married forever. When you and your spouse die, if you have been faithful Mormons, you will get your own planet that you can populate with your children. That's why some of the Mormons still believe in multiple marriages, polygamy. They believe that the more wives they have, then the more children they can have in the celestial kingdom. They'll get their own planet. They're living by works. Let me tell you, let me tell you their version of salvation. They also believe that if you commit a sin, and you ask God to forgive you, and He does, if you go out and commit that sin again, God both holds that sin against you, plus He unforgives when you did it before, and now you have all this sin laid back on top of you again. How would you like to live that way? I, I deal just enough knowing that my sins are forgiven, but that I did them to begin with. I am glad that I know that I am forgiven and that I don't have to have a stupid pair of underwear on that will get me into heaven. Matthew chapter 7. Turn there in your Bibles, please. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. Notice this now. Jesus said this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now look at verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many works. I want you to notice three times Jesus mentions that they will say to him what they did. Did we not do religious things? Did we not 
preach and pro listen, there will be preachers in hell because they believed too much in their own righteousness and their own deeds and their own works and they had not the faith and the belief and the trust of salvation. What a shame. Have we not preached? Have we not cast out devils? Look at what we've done. Lord, and you know what? There's been times, I'm just going to admit to you, there's been times when I, was be, I would be praying and asking God for something and then I would run down my recent resume to God. God, I did this. God, I've been good. God, I've done this. God, I, I've preached this. God, is, you know, I've, I've, I've done what you told me to. Only to remember that the greatest blessings that I've ever received in my life were given to me not when I was at my best. In some cases, I was at my worst. And God gave them anyway. You know, we like to hold things over our kids' heads. And say, now, if you don't do this, I'm not going to give you nothing. You are too. Aren't you? Aren't you, Melissa? Grandma Melissa. Listen, don't let her con you guys. She's going to give it to you no matter what. Because that's what grandmas and grandpas do. Amen? Remember, you're looking at old people who want to go to heaven. All right? No, I'm just... That just went against everything I preached, didn't it? I know a lot of people who do religious things. Why? They spoke in tongues. Oh, they were slain in the Spirit. Oh, they, they raised their hands during praise and worship time. You know what a lot of that is? A lot of that is, look at me. Look at me. Look at me, people. And God, look at me. I'm, I'm worshiping you. See what I'm doing? And let me tell you something. What has been taught in a lot of mainstream churches is a works-based salvation. They will teach people that if they worship God, then God will give them and pour out blessings upon them for worshiping Him. Is that wrong or right? Is it wrong or right? Do, do, should we believe that if we worship God, if we do this, and we close our eyes and we sing the songs, we sing the, we sing the words that are up on the screen 20 times straight through, and we get into a, what they call a spirit of worship, then does God then open up the floodgates of heaven and let it rain? Or... Should it not be that we worship God because He already has done those things for us? I didn't give something this morning to get something out of God. I've already got it. I've got way more than I could ever give back to Him. But He gave me that because of His mercy. I gotta move on. People who act religious go to religious services. They make a big show. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, listen. You you may not like me for this, but that that so-called revival out in in that uh, Wesleyan College in Kentucky to me that was all about works. It was all about looking at us. Okay, um, Matthew nineteen. Turn your Bibles there. Let me read this, Matthew 19, 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do? Listen to what he's saying. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. But, and he's right on this. Who is good? Tell me, who is good? Nobody. Except Jesus Christ. But he said... Um, 
But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man lied through his teeth. All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? He lied through his teeth and Jesus knew it. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But the young, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You know what his problem was? He did not believe what Jesus said. If he would have believed what Jesus said, he would have done what Jesus said. But he didn't believe him. That's why he didn't do it. I heard a judge say to a young lady that was um, in danger of losing her child uh, because of her drug problems and so on... And the judge said to her, you know, I didn't ask you, I didn't advise you, I didn't plead with you to do the, he gave her a list of things to do. He said, I didn't ask you to do any of those things. I ordered you to do them. And he said, you know what you did, young lady? You did the easiest things that you could do and think that would get by enough and that would get you in good uh, in a good place with this court. And he said, I'm here to tell you it didn't work. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you think you're going to fool God into thinking that you're right with Him and that you're ready to go into heaven and that you're worthy of it, if you think you're going to fool God, you're wrong. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. Even I have been a what, a, what is known as a fundamentalist Christian. I believe in the fundamentals of the faith. I believe in living right. I believe in, in uh, that you don't watch nasty things on TV or the internet. I believe you don't listen to, to nasty music. I, I, don't, I don't believe you ought to let your kids watch just anything in the world and so on and so on and so on. And I'm... I'm it looks like I'm picking on the Duggars here, and I'm not really, but they've got some problems. That oldest son of theirs, they raised him as good as they possibly could. He's in prison now. Big time pervert. And he went around the country with everybody saying, oh, look how godly he is. Look how godly he is. Why, he wears a suit every time he goes to church. He wears a nice tie. He was homeschooled. He didn't watch TV. They didn't raise him up on, on, uh, on uh, what does what is they give kids for hyperactive? Ritalin. They didn't, raise, they didn't raise him on Ritalin. They gave him good stuff out of the ground. And oh, they just, they lived a perfect life. We found out his life wasn't all that perfect, was it? It was a joke. He thought he could fool God because he fooled everybody else. And if that's, that's who you are right now, you're going to find something different from God and you're not going to like it. If you don't like what the preacher's saying, I promise you, you won't like what God's got to say. Romans 7, and I'll be done, I think. No, it doesn't look like I'll be done, does it? Turn to Romans 7 and I'll, I'll, I'll quit it. Romans 7. Your flesh, and here's what I'm going to tell you. Your flesh does not impress God. Everybody say amen to that. If you understand it, say amen. Your flesh does not impress God. Now, all my life, I have liked my hair cut real short. Okay? Now, the Bible says, does not nature itself teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair? Okay? Not a sin, a shame. Well, 
it's, I guess it's in my nature. I just like short hair. Some of you like yours way shorter than mine. Amen, Brother George. Hey, I mean, just way shorter. But I like short hair. Did you know that having my hair short all my life does not make me a better Christian? And you know, there was a time in my youth that I thought it did. I thought it did. I thought I was better than some of the people around me. I've never, I've never liked, you know, going around with no shirt on and, you know, wearing short shorts up to here. And I've just never liked that. And for a while, I thought I was better than the other kids around me because I didn't wear real short shorts and I always kept a shirt on. And I mean, it was just me. I'm telling you, I know what it's like to be legalistic and to, and to put on an outward adornment of Christianity, but it is far from right. I know what it's like. I've done it. I did it so well that a guy that I went to Bible college with, after a class, grabbed me and held me up with his forearm on my neck, on my throat, up to the wall like this, with his fist drawn, because I'd smarted off to him in class, because I thought I was better than he was. And he said, don't you ever talk to me like that again and everybody was standing there going and probably some of them was going hit him hit him but I did I thought I was way better than he was Romans 7 verse 18 if you have a pen, underline this in your Bible. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So if there is no good thing in your flesh, how can it please God? Tell me. Tell me, tell me the things that you personally can do that makes God happy. I'll tell you what the Bible says. A broken and a contrite heart. That's what makes God happy. When your heart is broken before God because of the things that you've done and the way you've treated other people and the, the religious airs that you put on to make people think that you're better than they are, you're a better Christian than they are. I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. And we're talking about Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived. He's saying this about himself. I'm reading it and I'm telling you, I'm saying it about myself. Now if I do, verse 20, and if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Listen, your fingers automatically know how to sin, don't they? Your eyes don't have to be trained to lust. They just automatically do it, don't they? I told you about that Makita table saw I sat and stared at at that store last week. Sat on a couch, went... Mm. Boy, I'd like to have that. And you know, I'm the worst carpenter in the world. The first skill saw, Kyle, I ever had, I got it out to cut a board, cut the cord right in half. That's the truth, isn't it? Truth. Truth. 
But I thought, boy, if I just had that saw, man, I could build the Taj Mahal with it. I see another law, verse 23, warring in my members in the, against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So don't try to impress God with what you do. Because he's not convinced he's not impressed your religious jewelry the religious garb that you put on the gospel song listen and listen i'm not against dressing right i'm not against ladies looking like ladies and men looking like men can i say that now i'm saying it anyway i don't care i believe men ought to be men women ought to be women amen hey women that was your chance ladies Hey, women! Okay, whatever. But none of that, none of that impresses God. And if you think you're going to fool God with any of it, God's not fooled. God does not forgive sins on the basis of you wearing a rosary blessed by a pope. That's stupid. That is so against the Bible, it's not even funny. And all the other religious things that we do and think that God will be pleased. God is pleased when we bow our heads and weep and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the prayer I prayed when I was being electrocuted and almost died. Not, God, remember now the things I've done for thee. That wasn't the prayer I prayed. The prayer was, God, forgive me. God forgive me.